welcome to a special Human Rights uh, Day edition of the Public Square on Nigeria Info. Thank you so much. Uh, perhaps we should just go straight to the point. Uh, in the past few months, treason charges have been used against journalists and activists in what is supposed to be a democracy. You've seen treason charges you know, used against people since the 1960s. What does this look like to you? Well, the first thing I have to tell you that uh, is that, first of all, I'm not a lawyer. And, uh, but I will tell you that as a layman, I uh, was horrified to read of treason charges being uh, leveled against a citizen for criticizing a state government. This was in the East. Um, speaking of Jalingo, whom I happen to... I wonder, is it the same uh, Agba Jalingo who worked with us during Pronaco? I, I don't know, it can't be, it must be the same person. And first of all, I wasn't aware that it's possible to commit treason against a state government. A state government. So that obviously is an anomaly. As I said, I'm waiting for lawyers to correct me on this. But to be one of the most absurd kind of political arrangement which made it possible for a non-sovereign government, because a state government is not a sovereign government. So how can you commit treason against a non-sovereign government to, to begin with? And for me, in any case, I look more uh, on the word prison as uh, treason as a crime which you commit against a people. A people, not just a, a kind of contraption. Yeah, which is, a contraption is there, it's made out from people, it represents the will of the people. And uh, the expression treason for me is just, uh, it's an anomaly in itself, I cannot even grasp it. So obviously, it's a device, a very dishonest device, meant to silence people when a government has no more answer to give. Still on the case of Agba Jalingo, sir, we understand from his lawyers that the state is using secret witnesses, that they will be screened off or otherwise hidden. In that case, the state should be accused of treason. Is the state in such circumstances which for me is potentially guilty of treason because the travesty of justice. And there's no state, there's no government without the plinth of justice. So how can they, how can you have secret trial? Because what you're talking about is a secret trial. I haven't heard that yet. I mean, things are happening in this country of which <laughs> I'm not aware. This is news to me. And at the federal level, sir, the case of uh, Shawore, who has been charged with uh, treason. Uh, I know you've spoken uh, about this, but to then charge him with treason and then not recognize the orders of the same courts that he has been taken before, how, how does that look? Well, it doesn't, one doesn't have to even think about it. Uh, this is a this is outlaw, it means we're living in an outlaw situation in which the people are being invited to formulate their own uh, legal structures. Because you cannot, ultimately, you're going to go to that court for a decision. Unless, of course, you're running a parallel government, which I suspect sometimes is what we're running. Now, there are different divisions of state which have turned themselves into government in which they accuse, they judge, and execute. I hope it won't get to real physical execution before we know where we are. You've said that when the government does not obey its own laws, that it's more or less an invitation to anarchy. Yes, indeed, because uh, it's, it, it's disobedience, as I said, calls to disobedience. If I recognize 
a certain structure of society as being the arbiter between myself as an individual, my own community, my own sphere of interest, you know, concentric, concentric circles and so on. And this is what binds all of us together. And another section of that social structure, that political structure says no. Well, why should I obey uh, that, uh, that refusenik? Why should I also not become a refusenik in terms of accepting the authority of that other branch of government? It's as elementary as that. And sooner or later, there will be civil disobedience which will mount, which will uh, just expand until it becomes, until the country becomes ungovernable. Many free dumb of expression organizations have uh, published reports saying that since 1999, when we returned to democracy, that we now have the highest number of journalists and activists that have been either arrested, uh, charged with treason, or disappeared. Uh, you played a very big role in returning Nigeria to democracy. And I recall that in 1999, you said that uh, we have uh, uh, high hopes. H have those hopes been dashed? Uh, the first comment is that we don't have a democracy. What we succeeded in achieving was an electoral process. And I think we succeeded also with that electoral process in, uh, uh, in eliminating the dictatorial tendency in government. Not in, sorry, in reducing, in reducing. But it's coming back. The sense of dictatorial uh, control over a constituency, over a polity, is becoming routine. You're having a massive disobedience of, uh, of court uh, orders. And even without the orders, you have uh, disobedience of the constitutional, both the overt and the implicit uh, provisions of the constitution. I want to remind you that it was during an election that we had introduced a real uh, a real process of force. There was an election in which soldiers were out and were in effect uh, uh, establishing a quarantine around the electoral process. In other words, someone somewhere was dictating who could move from A to B. A whole governor, you may remember, was prevented from going to campaign in another state was actually told virtually you cross that line I shoot you this is during an election and we say we're running a democracy each time there is an election let's say in one state even if that, that election doesn't affect all the other states people move to go and assist their own parties their own candidates this is what democracy is all about and you had an instance I mention this only because this happened under a government that was not military. But the military literally were in control. And we had secret recordings, which of course became public, where Minister of Defense, generals, etc., etc., conspired to move ballot papers around, actually conspired to rig an election. And the principal players, remember, were soldiers. They were highly placed officers, including the Ministry of Defense. So it's become clear that whether we're actually having the self-recognized ex-military in charge or even civilians in charge, it looks as if the military has not really left the premises. And attitudes are so ingrained that even sometimes when the civilian is in charge, he or she behaves in a military fashion. 
That's why I said, no, we don't have a democracy yet. No. President Buhari, can, sorry. President uh, Buhari said he's a born again Democrat. Yeah, you know, I was in fact, uh, I don't know whether he said it, but I know that I use that expression myself. And I think one had a right to expect that an individual who's undergone himself incarceration without trial for quite a lengthy period, and who has undergone the experience of being tear gassed during an electoral process, one had a right to hope that something has penetrated that mind. And when that individual also makes all the noises, all the right noises, again and again, I quote, I've come to the conclusion that there is no system, no better system to govern human beings than a democratic system. And you feel that that kind of statement is the result of tasting the other side of life. The same thing applies to those ones who have been imprisoned, who've been sentenced to death, and whose lives were saved by the activities of people like myself around the world, and also internally, secretively. I'm talking about, I'm not talking just about this individual, I'm talking about collective movement in which we have, you know, invoked all the forces, all the powers of the influence of the world to save lives like, like that. And who then orders, when he comes in as a civilian, orders the soldiers to go and literally wipe out an entire community? I'm talking about OD. Is the name OD and so on? So where on earth does redemption lie? Where on earth is there any internal questioning of which we believe all human beings are capable? And those who come out literally with one leg dangling over the void into the other world and somehow they snatched back. You feel that such people must have undergone some internal transformation. And when they make noises in that direction, you can believe, you have a right to believe, there must at least be some element of genuineness about this. But what do we get? Do you think this is because uh, so far we've had two former army generals, also two former military heads of state or dictators, return to government as civilians? Yeah. Do you think this has influenced the, the, the way things have turned out? Mm, only, to, only to a small extent. The reason is this. The struggle in most, in most communities, political struggle, has always been along the axis of power and freedom. Power on the one side, axis. And you see this axis in operation, and we've had it in operation in this country, even during civilian uh, regime. It has become accentuated during the Shadari government. Yeah, we began it over there. We began it since then. Remember the uh, emergency over the uh, uh, Western region, the wet seasons in which the people had to resort to self-help? Yes, to rescue themselves, you know, from clear, uh, not just putative dictatorship, but we were undergoing certain forms of dictatorship at the time. So the tendency is there, and it seems to be a permanent struggle, especially on this continent. Other societies appear to have transcended it. What we must tell ourselves, what we must acknowledge to ourselves, is that we have not yet transcended that mentality that human beings have to choose between power and freedom, rather than between uh, volition, methods of volition, methods of uh, systems of freedom, sy systems which guarantee the equality of every human being in that uh, society. But of late, we've been witnessing a kind of escalation and accumulation of that dictatorial tendencies. When somebody comes in and says, uh, I intend to uh, tamper with even the judiciary, and it means that next time, don't uh, think it's just a rhetorical outburst at that moment. It means that the mentality has not yet completely disappeared. 
Talking about the 60s, uh, you were, I believe, uh, Amnesty International House first Nigerian prisoner of conscience. Organizations like Amnesty International are now under pressure. In fact, uh, protesters said to be rented have been to their offices to say Amnesty leave uh, Nigeria and they've been called names. What do you think this suggests that even human rights or freedom of expression organizations are now being asked to leave the country? It's sinister. It means that what before was hidden, which is a good thing by the way, is now coming out overtly. You see, one of the most dangerous uh, situations, socio-political situations, any people can find themselves in, is when governance pretends. That phase of pretense uh, says, oh, this uh, unlawful act is just an aberration, we'll control it. Pretends, like the head of the DSS, as we read yesterday, going to apologize to the magistrate, uh, to the uh, judge, I beg your pardon, whose premises that organization had violated in the, an unprecedented way. So the head now goes and apologizes. We should take our lesson from the fact that that was not the first apology. It was an earlier one. And these DSS operatives apologized to the, uh, to the judge. And what did they do afterwards? They dashed outside to go and join their colleagues in rearresting somebody who's been freed on bail within the same judge's uh, premises, same jurisdiction. So now I hear that the head of the SSS, DSS is going to apologize to the judge. Don't believe it for one moment. All it means is that they believe they lost out this particular battle, but that they are determined to win the war. And what is that war? That perennial war between power and freedom. Uh, this morning, a uh, national newspaper published a front page editorial stating that henceforth it will refer to President Buhari as General Buhari and describe his government as the Buhari regime until uh, treason charges are dropped against journalists and the government backtracks. Uh, do you think this is appropriate under the circumstances? Well, if you read a statement which I made a few days ago, which I referred to Buhari, the papers who carried it correctly, exactly as sent to them, you notice that I refer to him as President Hyphen General Buhari. That was deliberate. It was addressed to him. It was, I wanted him to notice the difference. And that if he didn't, others would point it out to him. I said, President Dash General Buhari, because this is what we witness today. This is a reversion to type. And I think most Nigerians begin to recognize this. Let's move from the executive side to the parliament, to the National Assembly. Uh, we have uh, two bills in the National Assembly. One is the social media bill, which critics say is designed to curb uh, free expression. Then there's also the hate speech bill, which uh, in fact uh, contains a death sentence for people that are found guilty of undefined uh, hate speech. Uh, and you said recently that even though you've been a victim of fake news, that you, under no circumstances, support a death sentence. Yeah, that's a fact. I not only do not support a death sentence, I absolutely repudiate any attempt, conscious, unconscious, or let me just put it this way, any kind of law which can be interpreted and which can be used to curb freedom of expression. I totally loathe and despise bearers of fake news. I just, I cannot describe the depth of my resentment 
at the kind of damage which they do. But there are other ways of dealing with this. People like to use the shortcuts when in fact it's better to sit down, examine a problem, look at all the various uh, uh, ways of, you know, of, of combating those problems. What's happening outside, for instance, Bill Gates and all the others who control the media are being tackled by organizations, by governments, saying that, listen, you created this monster. You must enable the same technology to control you know, the abuse of it. So and this is the, you are referring to the internet mogul? To the internet, mogul. yes, the internet mogul. So that you must now, it's your responsibility, let's sit down and work this thing out together. Those nations I'm talking about are not saying we're going to block off access. No, they know this is wrong. This is, this is against human freedom. But they're saying, now let's work on it. The same means that uh, uh, facilitated this abuse. We have enough intelligence to be able to control. You can close down certain proven uh, sites which incite it. Even President Trump, you know, whatever his name is, a uh, powerful nation, is being warned that his uh, tweet may be shut down if he continues to use certain, to misuse it, to abuse the technology. Now that's what we should be doing. Not sitting down together because we've been hurt and we've been you know, violated in some way and then say, chop off his head. What kind of society is that? What kind of barbarism is that? So. The, our elected people also are part of the problem. They also suffer from this military mentality in which you solve a problem by eliminating the creator of the problem. Rather than tackling the problem, which can be germane to an entire community, how many people are you going to kill anyway? How many people are you going to kill? So we need to talk very strongly to our, our, our legislators and ask them to try and just uh, and be a little bit modernistic in thinking. The, the current Attorney General, when he was being screened by the Senate, uh, made a statement that uh, to him, national security is more important than uh, individual rights. Uh, and he was still confirmed as the Attorney General. What do you think should be the balance, if any, between national security and individual rights, especially freedom of expression? Well, let's talk about freedom of expression, let's talk about individual rights, which very often, in fact, translate as collective rights. You see, people like to, uh, to talk about individualism when in fact an individual is very often a representative of a collective. It's merely articulating what is being felt, what is being said, what is being undergone, you know, palpably. And then people say, oh yes, this man is uh, an individualist. Take for instance a comment, you know, an observation which I made uh, um, in Abuja just two days ago. We have a situation where, thank goodness, we're learning that quite, it's not just Mr. Bakary or Mr. Shawari uh, who are being kept behind. I mean, we knew that all along, but just we didn't know how deep the serious was. That there are people who've been held for three to four years in detention, three to four years in a democracy, and that they've been without able, I beg your pardon? Without trial. Without trial. And that in some cases, they've had to pay a bribe to be able to have a cell phone smuggled to them to let us on the outside know that they are being held illegally. Now, what becomes my responsibility when that happens? Is that individual concern only for himself? No. If I use my head, I will understand that it meant that what's happening to him can happen to me, can happen to you, can happen to my neighbors, can happen to my children. And if we do not speak up and act on behalf of that individual, we have failed the collective. We failed the entire community. So when they talk about national security, I think we all know what national security is. 
I want to ask these people, these agencies, what has keeping an individual in a dungeon for three, four years without trial, what has that got to do with national security? What has the failure to have gathered all the material you needed against Showare and Bakari in 100 days? 120 something days to be in there, and yet you want to keep them there without trial some more. It means you have failed as a security agency and should disband yourselves. If you have to sacrifice individual liberty because of national security, which we can prove to be a crude way of going about it, then it means you're incompetent. You're not using the most modern technology. You're not with the rest of the world. And I want to ask, for instance, the, the, the head of the DSS, what has depriving me of knowledge of those who are being immured at the moment, who are in turn, what has depriving me of the knowledge that they exist there got to do with national security? I want to know. I want to know what has been done on my behalf as a citizen. If you don't let me have that, then you're depriving me of my citizenship. You're turning me into just a cipher into a slave in a slave plantation. Could it be in fact that national security is being confused uh, with something that may just be of mere embarrassment to one or two people in Precisely government? Precisely that is the problem. That is why I say that freedom of expression, of information, the sharing of information, is essential to democracy, is essential to openness, to accountability. I mean, somebody, let's say, is ready to expose somebody else who has enough influence, enough money to bribe a few operatives, then it means that that uh, quote-unquote whistleblower can be hidden away forever. And I'm not in knowledge that I'm being robbed. I'm not in knowledge that people are being killed in order to cover up the looting of treasury. Everything is a mesh. One thing hooks onto another in terms of violation of our humanity, violation of our human rights, violation even of our def definition as dignified, as human beings endowed with dignity. Now, having said that, let me backtrack a little bit and say that I'm not saying, because the next thing I know, people will see this and they will quote, they will misquote me again. I'm not saying they're not issues of national security. Of course, they're very serious issues. For instance, uh, Boko Haram, that's a serious uh, security issue. And let me use this opportunity, by the way, to do something which we don't often do, to actually commend our soldiers for confronting this level of insecurity head on and making enormous sacrifices. I want them to understand that it's not that they are not appreciated. It's those opportunists who want to use the reality of genuine insecurity, of genuine menace to existence. It's they who create all the problem. They make us spend so much time on them that we forget to thank those who are actually uh, confronted, those who really <coughs> solving issues of uh, our national security. So there are issues of security. But then, it's amazing, the kind of uh, double, triple definitions which go with uh, uh, the expression security. I consider, for instance, that the, those who were involved in the recent attacks, and they've abated, those attacks seem to have abated somewhat, we thank those who are responsible for that abatement, by the way. But <clears throat> when somebody, when you had hundreds of people killed, forces moving in overnight, massing in full view, waiting until dark to pounce on innocent villagers. I'm talking now very specifically of the Mieti Ala, the um, herdsmen, you know. And after experiences, after traumatization of other human beings, other communities on that level, somebody comes out 
and says, what are they talking about? This is the consequence of a certain law which has been passed and says in effect, there will be more of that if that law is not rescinded. Now that is an issue of national security. That's the kind of person who should be arrested, interrogated and, said, and uh, told, asked, just what do you mean? Who are you? What is your business? You're just a tail of a dog and you're saying that you want to wag the dog and that anybody who doesn't allow you deserves the fate which we have seen, which we have already experienced on behalf of others. Now that's the kind of person who constitutes a genuine uh, 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 factor of insecurity and menace to the, to the nation. Was he ever arrested? Never. Nothing touched him. He went on to repeat that statement. He went on even to threaten other states so that if you don't allow, uh, if you don't accept Ruga, then you deserve whatever you get. And he's walking around free and sure, all he does is, um, as far as I'm concerned, make some student agitative uh, noise, revolution now, even expressions like days of rage and so on. What exactly does it mean? What forces? Does he have, has he, have we heard of Bakari or Shore mounting midnight raids on sleeping villages? Have they been caught with arms? So the real menaces, the real threats to our security, they are walking free. And so this kind of uh, quadruple, quintuple, septuple interpretations, convenient interpretations of security, of insecurity, these are issues which I think we have to sit down I really debate and it's have a common language and it has to be a language which does not impinge on genuine security which is reinforced which is uh, which is in fact uh, fundamental to genuine security is freedom of expression if you don't say what you know openly which threatens the viability of my society you know then what kind of uh, democracy are you running? What kind of security is that? At a technical level, sir, there have been calls to separate the offices of the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice. Do you think that that technical separation would make any difference? I, I, I find that completely irrelevant. What matters to me is that somebody who once held the two positions, Attorney General and Minister of Justice, and who was on his way to take up a position with the United Nations was butchered in his bedroom. The representative of the essence of justice in this country was butchered. Until today, nobody has been able to find out, to pull out. And now that is insecurity for you. So technicality is like, if you want to abolish even Minister of Justice and use another expression completely, if you want to create an ombudsman and say that his functions are the functions of both Attorney General and Minister of Justice, okay with me. On corruption, sir, you were at uh, an anti-corruption event uh, recently with the EFCC. Uh, w what role do you see that corruption plays in undermining democracy? Well, it's a pity that uh, sufficient um, attention wasn't given, is not being given to the fact that it was not even the EFCC as such, uh, which was at the center of this particular exercise. It was the uh, maritime uh, division, the shippers council uh, among them, in fact, principal among them. In other words, this was an entity, a quasi-governmental entity which felt sufficiently agitated about what was happening in its own constituency to involve the EFCC and say, look, let's join hands in this particular effort. In other words, I don't see why Freedom uh, Park, uh, where we are right now, if it's beleaguered by serious uh, accountability issues, cannot invite the EFCC and say, let us have a rally on behalf of Freedom Park. This is what the FCC 
is there for, and to, of course to investigate and to anticipate and you know cut the neck of uh, corruption. So it's an issue which concerns every individual because it's an issue of justice and injustice. Corrupt forces have led to the wrong people uh, being in critical places. If you can buy position, which is corruption, and you can use that position as a multiplier effect. Because once, once you get to a position corruptly, you're going to have around yourself only corrupt people, at least those who are corruptible. And your methodology of performance will be the corrupt uh, path. So it involves all of us. It involves, uh, um, what's, it, what's that examination called? Common uh, examination. Common uh, 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 it, yes, it involves that. If that system is corrupt, then you're going to have the children of the wealthy who are dunces taking the position of young generation, really bright, brilliant individuals who can profit from the education. If you have, uh, if you permit corruption to be the, the norm, so where do you turn? Where does corruption not affect? So many people think one is being sentimental about corruption. No, we have known the effect of corruption individually. We have been approached, efforts have been made to co-opt us, and we know what would have happened to really bright talent if we had succumbed to the kind of overtures that we've received in our existence. And so this kind of rally for me, these rallies can never be too, too much. These conferences, corruption is an, it's a universal disease. In certain countries, they just shoot people once you're found uh, corrupt. I don't believe in that, on that level of capital punishment. But, and that's what I was trying to emphasize in my contribution, that people shouldn't just look at corruption as an isolated thing. It's a, it's a gangrenous, uh, it has a gangrenous effect on the entire society, on our, on our very existence. It, it vitiates talent, energy, uh, which is unfair to those who want to play it by the rule. One more important question on the question of corruption is systemic corruption. Uh, we've seen recently uh, scenario in which uh, ex-governors, or well, governors at the time, passed laws uh, to ensure uh, pensions equivalent to the pay of sitting governors, uh, sometimes to the tune of two, three hundred million a year, plus ten million a month pocket money, plus a free house in their state capital and Abuja and anything from between two to six cars changed every two or three years with cooks, stewards, drivers, uh, security. Uh, this kind of situation, some people have described it as some kind of state capture where the political elite, even when they are out of office, want to continue <laughs> you know, earning uh, you know, huge salaries which they are not working for. Uh, how do you think this can affect the resources of the country uh, and the levels of poverty and governance? For me, it's a personal thing because till today, I haven't got my pension. Many people look at me and they, say, they will say, oh, he doesn't need it anyway. That's not the issue. Whether I need it or not, the fact remains. And I do need it, by the way. The fact remains that till today, I do not have a pension. I have not received my pension. There are people working on it, in fact, who've taken it up on my behalf. But the very fact that people have been working on this for quite a while, and they haven't yet sorted out my papers sufficiently, for me to collect my pension says a lot about what's going on in this country. But objectively speaking, why should somebody who had his own profession, and who even while he's governor does not destroy whatever he was doing before. Let's say he was a former professor. He can go back to being a professor. He can still collect his pension, you know, if he's over the age for the work is done. Some kind of severance token appreciative 
um, donation, I don't mind. But this is robbery. What is going on right now in states is sheer robbery. Even the pension of uh, former heads of state require looking into. It's exorbitant. And I've always said this. It is exorbitant. It is not necessary. And I've seen some of the, the lists. Uh, some years ago, I think the, even the House of Assembly proposed some kind of pension scheme, which included paying for the coffin in which they will eventually be buried. This was tabled on the House of uh, Assembly, the, rep the House of Representatives or Senate, I can't remember. It was obscene. And to begin with, we have to change the system. When, how, I don't know, but I know it has become necessary. It's expensive. We cannot run it. And we've said it, we've said it again and again. And then you come in there and you legislate for your own. After a term of four years, maximum eight years, you then have a fat, as you, you've listed some of them, not, that's not all of it. I think it's, it's criminal. And I was glad to notice some of the governors who said that they have refused, they have rejected it. It shows that there are people still with a kind of integrity in this country, but it's got, it should be eliminated. And uh, sooner or later, people will rise and uh, demand all this money back. That's all. Lastly, sir, uh, Freedom Park set up within the walls of a former prison. Uh, is this some kind of metaphor for the country? <laughs> <laughs> you are a pessimist. <laughs> I, on the other hand, look at it <laughs> as an expression of optimism. Uh, that a place of tears, a place of uh, tyranny, and I'm going back to colonial times. Remember, this used to be a colonial prison. Never forget that. Some of our sta staunchest nationalists have passed through here. The, uh, where the gallows used to stand, in that corner over there, is where there's now a stage for performances. So for me, this is a place of hope. But let us not lose the, uh, the, uh, the pessimistic, uh, quote-unquote, it's not really pessimism, it's, it's, it's realism, that particular approach. I remember when I visited one of the, uh, the states, uh, one of, uh, and I was taken round. The governor was showing me what uh, was uh, what has been achieved under his regime, and I saw a prisoner. I mean, a, a prison, modern, modern prison, yeah. good facilities, humane conditions there, physical conditions, facilities. And when we came out of there, I said, "Hmm, that man is wise." He's looking after where he will retire to when he leaves office. That person is on trial at the moment for corruption. Uh, he's escaped for a while because he's, uh, he's moved into other areas. But this is what I've always been telling people. The fact is that this sword of Damocles is hanging over his head. And we've seen it actualized. A few times, not sufficiently, but the most dramatic recently, the sentence handed down to an ex-governor. And when people have, uh, for instance, tried to attack me, saying and I have not been uh, speaking up about uh, uh, corrupt governors, I just tell them, I'm not going to waste my breath. I've refused to waste my breath any longer because they have immunity. So until we change that system, I mean, and this goes all the way back, all the way back. I've not wasted my breath on the malfeasances of any government. All I've done is collaborate very sturdily with ICPC and uh, EFCC to make sure that uh, public uh, corrupt pressure doesn't vitiate their capabilities. And I've said that when they come out of office, I've told EFCC, I want to see you waiting at the door for them. But right now, there's nothing one can do unless we change the system. 
and thank goodness one is seeing it being manifested piecemeal. As I said, not fast enough, not comprehensively enough, but at least as a lesson to others. That's sufficient. Professor Oleshenka, thank you so much, sir, for joining this special edition of uh, the Public Square on Nigeria Info, um, held in Freedom Park. Thank you. You're welcome. And this is not just the Public Square, it's Freedom Square. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.